the short game. It's a show where we talk about games that uh, pack a great amount of gameplay and story into a tiny amount of time carved out of your schedule in your life. We're here today to talk about A Dark Room. It's a fabulous game that uh, was brought to our attention by Laura, so we brought Laura back on the show. Hello. Welcome. Let me introduce our guests today. We have three hosts and one guest, which is a great structure for an interview. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not an interview it's anymore. She's been on the show like, how many times have you been on now? You've been on like three times? Three times? Long yeah. time uh, repeat guest uh, slash basically you're a host now, Laura Nash. Laura has a great pedigree of talking about games, uh, including her experience in game design. You guys know who Laura is. She's awesome. She uh, she has brought some of my favorite games to my attention, some of the best games for our show. And so always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. I, playing too many games on iPhone and iPad has to work out somehow. Oh, yeah. You know, it, there's a lot of steaming piles in the App Store, but we found some really beautiful gems amongst the... Haystack. Some really polished <laughs> turds. Amongst the steam. <laughs> uh, so this time, and of course we've got my brother, my bro host, Reagan Kelly. That's me, I'm Reagan. How's it going, Reagan? I'm really good. Um, this, has been, uh, this has been an interesting week for me. My wife's out of town, and um, uh, I've been doing a whole lot of nothing. Uh, there's, there's no food in the house. It's just me and the dog. Eat the dog. I told you already about my uh, about my great discovery for today, which was that uh, I've realized that working from bed is the new working from home. And uh, oh. today I uh, I blazed new trails in oh. my lifestyle. So what you're telling me is that uh, you spilled the grease from a hot pocket on your, <laughs> your naked lap. Is that what? <laughs> no, thank is that you. What happened to you today? No, no, oh, no, man. no. One scatological joke, and already there's some nudity references. This is going to be a pretty rated R version uh, of the podcast. I'm sorry, welcome to uh, welcome to the short game after dark. You shouldn't have let me host this one. No, apparently. Um, but uh, let's talk about. And my name is Nate. I'm happy to be here. Oh my god! Oh, Nate, are you here? Reagan, never let me, never let me do the intros again. I feel like we should just scratch this whole thing and start over. You know me from 95 percent uh, of the other episodes. I'm happy to be here again. All right. Well, uh, it, Reagan will re-record this intro for me. But uh, will I now? Enjoy. Um, let's start. Uh, let's start off about a dark room. What a what a weird game. Oh my gosh. Super it's, weird uh, and really, really interesting. And yet very familiar. First off, um, Laura brought this game to our attention, but I'd like to know, Laura, where you heard about the game or how this sort of, how this cropped up for you. Well, I heard about it um, because someone foolishly introduced me to Cookie Clicker, which I played for maybe half a day and was like, this game is terrible. Um, and so the Candy Box Cookie Clicker um the idle game movement. Someone said, wait a second, you actually have to give the good one of these a try. So um, they pointed me to Dark Room on the web. I didn't actually play it until um, Touch Arcade, the um, review blog, um, said, you know, one of those, it's 99 cents, you should just try it. Don't read anything about it. And I tend to love those games. That's how I found Little Inferno. So I gave it a shot, played it through, and um, almost... A year later, six months, eight months later, it was on sale and I pointed it out to you guys. And by on sale, we mean it was free. Which it was, was free. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. free. That's it went from like 99 cents to free. It's yeah. basically free. 99 cents is literally the lowest allowable price on the App Store. So first off, before we dive too far into this game, um, do you have an iPhone in your pocket, listener? Yeah, go ahead and get the game. Honestly, if you're listening to us on an iPhone... And you probably are. You can get online right now and pay $1 for this game and play it while you listen to us talk about it and probably get decently into it. Yeah. So or the show if you're like me, um, I, sorry, the kind of the cool part about idle games, at least this is something that that I had really had much experience with is I was able to play this like while living my life. I, I, I did not sit sit down to play a dark room very often and i total have spent about five or six hours on this which we'll get into later how that's possible but i played this at work 
I played it on like little lunch breaks. I played it while um, I was playing some games that had some loading times, and I would just pull it out and <laughs> and get it going. And which you know is really where I am at this point, cramming as many games together at at the same time. But idle game, it's fantastic. I was able to play this and really enjoy it and get the full experience. I believe while never sitting down. Like this is my a dark room time to play. Have you guys ever played any? Any other idle games while we're on the subject? I I personally have uh, tried out some stuff like, you know, I, I think I signed into Farmville one time. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I have, um, for, I, I like avoided Farmville mostly because I knew how much I loved Harvest Moon. And I just knew that it wouldn't give me the what I was looking for from Harvest Moon. And I just avoided all farming simulators, knowing that, they could never touch my heart the way Harvest Moon did. Yeah. Well, I, I avoided it because it's garbage. I think I, I think I tried it before I realized it was garbage, which is so much worse. Well, there's that too. And if you invite me on Facebook to play your game, that is like the least likely way to get me to play your game. Because I know you get like an extra acre or something if I play. Hmm. Or I don't know how it works. <laughs> so I never actually heard the phrase idle games before I was reading some information about this show or about this game um, and it's a pretty apt phrase there are a lot of ways that you can play this game that sort of allow it to continue playing in your pocket or in the browser tab that you've you know tabbed away from but we kind of say this show is a show about fitting games into your life and this is a game that really really fits into your life but what really struck me about this game because i've played other games that kind of have this mechanic where you leave the game for a while and when you come back something has happened you know i've played some of the uh, nimble bit games like tiny tower or their their train one i forget the name of it now but i played a ton of that and that involves leaving the game for a while and waiting for something to happen and coming back to it and i usually don't like that mechanic very much and when it even when it's used well i think it sometimes actually feels like a hindrance to gameplay but this game this game totally turned that on its head for me. And we'll talk about the actual mechanics of why this game works so well and what's so fascinating about it later. But what I think really struck me about this game was that, well, yes, I would put my phone in my pocket and not play it for a while and kind of let it idle in my pocket. But the whole time I was thinking about this game, like that was what really made this game amazing for me was, you know, I've played Tiny Tower, but I wasn't thinking a damn about what was happening in my tower while it was in my pocket. I knew exactly what was happening in my pocket. The tiny tower was making money very slowly, and eventually I would have to go back to it and collect rent or whatever it was. But with this, I was thinking about this game constantly, all day. That was the thing that really struck me about this, was all day I could not stop thinking about this game and, and what I was going to do when I returned to it. It, it, was, it was incredibly <laughs> addictive in that way. I had the same experience and it it definitely reminded me of when we talked about uh, Little Inferno and we got onto the subject of timers in games. And you know, you brought up Cow Clicker. I think we talked a lot about Cow Clicker in that episode. It's something that is very easy to uh, criticize in a game if the game is bad because it creates this addictive mechanic. But this game turned out to be so good on a lot of different levels. Reagan, could you re you said you had the description from the App Store? Oh yeah. So that's that's one of the things about this game that's really interesting. If you visit the App Store page for this game, well actually, first off, this game began as a web game. You know, this game you can visit it. We'll have a link in the show notes to where you can play mm -hmm. this game for free on the web right now. And when you enter the game, there is no title screen. There is no description of the game. There is nothing but the game. You enter immediately into the game and you get a description that says something along the lines of you're in a dark room and you have a big ass button that says light the fire. You can light the fire and that's your one action that's allowed in that initial moment. And for several minutes, actually, all you can do is that one thing, light the fire. Um, the, the App Store description is a little bit more evocative. So when you visit the, this page on the App Store, when you're looking, and I think we all primarily played this in the iOS version, I should say that the game was originally developed by Michael Townsend um, as a web game. It's meant to be sort of played in a tab in your web browser as you go about your day. Um, and that version's pretty good. And it's actually really well done. Um, 
but the mobile version that we all played, and I think sort of the definitive version, was based on Michael Townsend's version, but developed by uh, another developer, Amir Rajan. And um, Amir developed this game for iOS. Unfortunately, there's no other version. There's no Android version or um, other smartphones or devices. But uh, you can get this for iOS for 99 cents. And I think that's sort of the definitive version of the game. If you visit the the App Store page for this game, you're going to see just one screenshot which is weird. It stands out because it's got just a single screenshot of the first screen that you'll see when you open the game. And just a single sentence of description, which says, awake, head throbbing, vision blurry, come light the fire. That's it. That's all you get as an intro to this game. And that's what's really evocative about this is that you look at this App Store page or you begin the game on the web and you have absolutely no idea what this game is all about. You enter into this experience with no description. It doesn't say, hey, this is a game that features blank mechanic and it's reviewed by blank arcade and they think it's a 9.5 out of 10. And no, it's basically just that. You get this very sparse description, a single screenshot, and that screenshot is as sparse as they come. This game is done entirely in text and uh, there's basically no graphics at all. The graphics are entirely in sort of ASCII art and buttons. Um, Yeah, do you want to talk about the beautiful sound design? (laughs) (laughs) Like while we're talking about the... uh, Yeah, aesthetics-wise. If if there was a sound in that game, I didn't hear it. Yeah, Yeah, there's there's not. It it, it took me... Zero sound. (laughs) The perfect game to to play while you listen to our podcast. Yeah, there's no sound, and yet the first thing I wrote down as the description was atmospheric. Mm. I think that it's incredibly immersive. It's this instructionless game that you start making choices, and then you actually think about what those choices mean in the story of the game and for you a little bit, too. And it's you know, the lack of any imagery, there's no sounds. You're kind mm-hmm. of just um, getting stuck in this, you know, button pressing game. But I found it very intense in many ways and very creepy and very memorable. And I think that's what makes it such a little oddball is there's nothing we normally say that's immersive or, you know, all the tricks that we're used to in games to make us love them aren't here. It's just mechanics and text. That's all they got. And it works beautifully. Yeah, this might be like the opposite of the last game we did, Ethan Carter, <laughs> which we went, we raved about how beautiful and... The graphics were. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, and and this is a white, a very bright white screen. And With some black text words. and buttons. And the buttons aren't even colorful. But you know what? One of my one of my things I'm most excited to talk about with this game is the same thing that I raved about, literally raved. Uh, I got a little too excited talking about the environmental storytelling in Ethan Carter, and this mm-hmm. game is one that makes a lot of use of that same idea uh, in a very different way. Uh, it's just those incredibly evocative descriptions. Friends of the short game know that Reagan and I have an abiding love of text adventure games, which are just that, you know, uh, stark text on a white page, the mechanics and the description and, you know, nothing, nothing but. And that's what this game is too. In a lot of ways, this game remains as sparse as that first screen all the way through to the end. Listeners, you'll probably realize that we're being deliberately vague here. Um, And we apologize, but we're going to come to our spoiler break here in a moment. Something about this game really benefits from experiencing it fresh without a great deal of expectations set in advance or understanding. I mean, you can look at the App Store page and know that the developers want you to experience this game without having a deep understanding of what it's going to entail. And we want the same for you, dear listener. So, um... We're going to be talking about this game in some detail, moment by moment and mechanic by mechanic as we go, but we don't want to spoil all that for you, so we're probably going to be coming to our spoiler break here pretty shortly. If you haven't played this game, it is... How long did it take everybody to complete? Yeah, one of the beautiful things is it tells you 
Uh, my first run was completed in 181 minutes. Uh, mine took 288 minutes, so I spent. Uh, I, I took my time with it. I can, I cannot understand how you did that. <laughs> I bailed on my very first run halfway through because I wanted to switch to my iPad from my iPhone. <laughs> uh, and my second run. Uh, my first complete run took me almost exactly two hours. Yeah, I think the first run was probably about three because I was doing dishes. <laughs> um, and then the, the second run was longer. Um, I would say that if you are sitting in your iPhone in hand and saying, I'd rather play this on the web and save my dollar, that we're saying it's sparse on the iPhone. I think that from an interface design point of view, some of the decisions they made, the way they interrupt actions, the way they share messages on screen is part of the way they get you to immerse. And I would say that if you're saying you don't want to spend the dollar and you'd rather keep it in a tab, you're not going to have the same immersive experience that we did playing on an iPhone or yeah. iPad. Yeah. So it's a wonderful port. Pay the dollar. You'll get a lot more out of it. Yeah. If you have an iOS device, do that version if you can. Yeah. And, and furthermore, if you're making that choice right now, I, I highly recommend it on the iPad. Uh, this is a game that made a lot of really good um, use of the extra screen space by showing you more information. You know, that's funny. I actually completely disagree. I preferred playing this on the iPhone really a lot. <laughs> and the, the reason for that is that being an idle game, something that I liked to you know, leave and come back to at a moment's notice, having it in my pocket as opposed to in my bag with my iPad was a big improvement for me. I actually started this game on the iPad and about an hour into it after realizing that I wasn't getting a chance to play it quite as much as I would like, I switched over to my iPhone and I actually took the trouble to like transfer my save over, which is not easy to do. I had to connect it to my computer and like download the save to the computer and upload it back. Oh, I didn't there. even bother with that. Didn't uh, know that was possible. You twins. Wow. Like you twins always doing the opposite of each other <laughs> every time. And I was wearing a red shirt and he was wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I would actually totally uh, argue that the iPhone version is the definitive version. The iPad version gives you a multi multi-paned interface that lets you see more information on screen at a time, but you can get all the same information with a couple of quick taps on the iPhone. And I loved playing this on my iPhone, whipping it out of my pocket and quickly checking how my story was progressing. You know, so, okay, make your own decision on that. Uh, if you, uh, <laughs> hey, it's universal. You can play it on either. If you have both, uh, if you have an iPhone and an iPad, you know, like me and Reagan do, you know, good for you. See, I actually had, <laughs> got, I held my choices. iPhone and my iPad simultaneously, and I had two games going at the exact same time, just so that both of you are wrong. That, Nate, that's the definitive experience. <laughs> And if you don't have both an iPhone and an iPad, don't bother because, I mean, come on, what are you, peasant? My iPhone is glued to the back of my iPad. So. For those of you <laughs> completely confused, this is not a multi-screen experience. Yeah, We've said no. nothing about this game. I don't want anyone thinking we really this actually haven't said anything at all. Devices. That's the crazy thing about <laughs> <said> this game. <nothing. laughs> okay, we're not serious. We're doing our best not to spoil anything, and we essentially haven't said anything about the real content of this game yet. Let's roll out the spoiler break. All right, so that we can hold talk on. About Let game. me go and get my drum set. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Here we go. All right, I got it set up. Things are ready. Okay, are you ready for the spoiler break now? Here it is. That was your spoiler break. <laughs> All right, now put away the drums, Reagan. Okay. Right, we'll, uh, we'll wait for you. Let's get into this. I would just like to start with as brief as possible elevator pitch descriptions of this game. I'll kick us off because I think mine would not work pre-spoiler break because it reveals too much. Then that's a terrible elevator pitch. It's a little buzzwordy. I'd like to hear a better elevator pitch. You probably have heard one now, but it's basically, it's a fast playing roguelike idle game text adventure it's not a roguelike at all it's an rpg it's not a roguelike. it is a roguelike it, is a roguelike. it has a baby roguelike built into it, it. does it, it has it, it, sort, of, in, sort of it is like one of the most it's ascii art which is like total roguelike throwback yeah that you're literally represented how how like rogue do you have to be to be a roguelike <laughs> you're represented by an at sign and you're walking around trying to find other letters on a plane of of Commas and periods. And when you die, you have to start it over. Yeah. Well, now you don't true. have to start the whole thing over. You do have to of start course, the roguelike so part not... over. So why don't we let yeah. Shane complete his elevator pitch? Nah, tell that guy to shut up. <laughs> oh, no, that was about it. I think that, that here's the thing. 
we, we talked about the idle games. The Id- it's, a, it's an idle game with a plot and an adventure. And the thing that it, it pulls in from the idle game uh, idea that is really, really wonderful is that it's almost impossible to get into a fail state, even though you feel challenged at all times. I don't think it is possible to completely fail at this game. No, because at, at worst, you just wait longer until you have the stuff you mm-hmm. need. But we should set up the resource concept before we get well, too sure, far into Well, sure, but let me, the... let me give my, uh, my elevator pitch for this game. Let's hear it. This is a game that starts with the most simple mechanic possible. Hit a button and something happens. And it, it explains that to you in the most extreme possible sense. You have one action when you start this game. You hit a button, and that button says light the fire. And then it starts a timer, and you can see that it's going to take some time before you can light the fire again. And that's all you can do. And then this game takes that tiny mechanic, hit a button, see something happen. And it Stoke builds fire. on it. it. It zooms out again and again and again. You start in a dark room where all you can do is is light your fire, and eventually you're, you know conquering the globe and it does that all through essentially the same mechanic even when you're going on your adventure your adventure involves hit a button see a small reaction hit a button see another small reaction most of them have timers associated it takes that tiny mechanic of hit a button see something happen in a in a simple text format and expands it out to something where you feel like you're going on a on a true adventure. Um, it, 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 it's amazing. That's that's the thing that really struck me about this game is that is that zoom from the microcosm of the dark room all the way out to the global scale and the adventure that your character goes on. Absolutely, I would. I I think that for me was the most important part of this game too. And in the developer described that as a puzzle box. And I've heard that term used for narratives before, but not for games and like for stories. It gives you, it starts by giving you one thing and then it builds a scaffolding around that thing outward. And as it grows, you have, uh, it's like the opposite of peeling off the layers of an onion. You start with the core, lighting the fire, press that button to light the fire. And then it gives you layer after layer outside and beyond that but you always have that core to move up and down from it turns from a button clicker to a resource management game to an rpg to something else and it's as it opens up more and more choices and opportunities and actions you can take you start having to meet the consequences of those actions and very few games talk about what happens after you make a sword this game will tell you, and it won't hit you over the head with it. It'll just kind of dole out micro-story segments. It makes you feel bad. It makes you feel bad for making a sword. (laughs) It makes you feel... I'm trying to get to the end. It makes you feel really bad about yourself for doing what every single D&D character ever has done. It makes you feel terrible. Everyone who ever picked up a sword is a terrible it person. Does. Man. Well, it's it does that by being incredibly emotionally effective in its descriptions. Because it's the worst, because you know you have to build a sword to get stronger, and then you get told how terrible you are for building a sword to get stronger. <laughs> and then you threaten people, and they yell at you for threatening them. And you're like, but that's my job as a hero. I'm supposed to be the winner. You're making me feel terrible for winning. Yeah. yeah. You get guns, and they're like, why do you have guns? And you're like... I need these guns. They have guns. And they're like, don't go out there anymore. And you're like, I'm definitely not not going out there. So I'm going to get these guns. I'm going to get these grenades. And I'm going to kill sometimes children. I'm going to kill these kids because I have no other option or die. And it makes you make these choices. And you just like you feel bad. But you know it's for the good, I guess, because you think you're doing what's right. <laughs> it's for the good. <laughs> it's for the good of you. It's for the it's for the gameplay. It's for the addicting gameplay. You only want to get more, and you want to do better, and you want to get stronger, and you want to win because you want to unlock the next action. You want to get the next little piece of the puzzle. Another layer to the puzzle box. And it tells you that the only way to to get another layer is to do something awful. 
and you find yourself doing that awful thing over and over and over again until you win the game. And you know who else wanted to be bigger and stronger? Hitler. <laughs> we just Godwinned. Uh, I'm sorry. How many minutes I just, into the I just uh, Godwin's law. I just, <laughs> let's bring Hitler into this. Why minutes, not, guys? All right. Usually takes us 45. That's what this game does to you. And 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 we can bring in uh, we can bring in Nietzsche as well. Um, one of the things that I thought this game did that was amazing was that when you finish the game, you unlock a developer's commentary, which is great. Such a thing. I wish every game would do this. And uh, one of the things that he brought up was that this is a that when they were initially designing this game, they thought about. Uh, including uh, Nietzsche quotes in the game at various different points. And those were eventually cut, but they kind of inform the theme and the tone of the game. And the core one uh, is the one that everyone has heard. Um, You know, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And when you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. And that's the the Nietzsche quote that sort of informs the the theme or the tone of the game. Uh, And it's a bit of a cliche, but something about enacting it in this form really kind of brings that home as a, as a theme. I also say there are opportunities to be good in the game. There are sometimes beggars who show up or, and ask for furs. There are, you know, people who stop by and you have, you know, I enjoy the fact that it's very unclear if being nice to the beggar will help you in this game. Whereas most games make it such a clear-cut moral choice that you know that if you do not, you know, give the apple to the old woman, that she will curse you and generations of your family to come. This <laughs> oh, game, what game is that in? Every Disney fairy tale. <laughs> What's the quote from Vanishing of Ethan Carter? It's something is is vanity at the core of charity or something like that. Uh, you. you you're only, at least in this game, and at least to me, the only reason you're saying anything to these beggars and giving them your cured meat and your leathers is that you know there's an off chance to get a, a perk, right? I mean, I like you're not sitting there like, now's my chance to redeem myself. It's built into the mechanic. I think you're supposed to feel like you're just using them. So this is what this is what really I loved about the game is that every time they expand out a little bit, They're doing it both in terms of the narrative, adding more detail, adding characters, adding new scenarios or situations that can happen while they're adding these mechanics. So, you know, once we once we leave the forest with the fire, you know, we've met the builder. We've met the most important character in the game. And when we get out into the forest, you know, we start to encounter things that happen like a wild boar runs into into town or some villagers show up that we might be able to build a house for and things like that yeah so let's talk through the actual growth of the game and the the story and the mechanics that get added as as we progress through this story this is where it introduces the managing of an economy into the game and this is one of the things that i think is the best elements of the early game Um, This is a great element, and it really reminded me of some of my favorite games where you're managing an economy. Uh, But what we start off with is it gives us the builder, who is the most important character in the game. She stumbles up to your fire, and she says, I think the introduction for her is she says she can build things. She says she's a friend. You know, I don't know. The tone of that was very evocative. And I should say, at this point, your character, who is anonymous throughout the entire game, but your character is described only as the Wanderer. And uh, the game is entirely in lowercase, so uh, it's unclear uh, if that's a proper noun or a or a uh, just a description. So your character, um, he goes out to gather wood, and he brings the wood back. Really, gathering the wood is a very simple action. It only gets you a little bit of wood. You basically never have to press this button once you get past the early game. But the action of going out and gathering wood is very frequently the trigger for more narrative. And so you find yourself continuing to do it because every so often it just drops you, you know, a little a little thing that says something like, you know, I have to keep the fire going. I have to keep her warm. And that's how it keeps you going through this very early game where the only mechanic is 
I'm going to collect wood. And once you've collected that wood, you can use the wood to light the fire and keep the builder warm who has arrived and, and you know, you're trying to protect. But you can also use it to build traps and also eventually to build a cart that will help you haul wood more quickly. And this court kind of uh, presages the the later game where eventually we start building much larger scale things. Um, and the first thing that the builder allows you to build are huts. Um, so of course I immediately built huts because I mean, you know, why wouldn't you build huts? Uh, huts sound great. You can build huts and stay warm. Perfect. So you build some huts and then other people, villagers, it describes them as start moving into the huts. Absolutely. And, and now we've introduced an area in the game. This is one of really, I think three locations in the game. There's the forest where we have the fire or three modes, yeah. 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 There's now is introduced the the village. And the the description of the village starts out as I think it's like a tiny village. Um a tiny village, or a or modest one village. Hut. When you add some more huts, it's a modest village. And the village is a mode of the game where you are collecting and managing resources, but now you have uh, the villagers working for you. And you can assign them to become uh, a gatherer, or as you and the builder build more types of buildings, you can have them tanning leather or different things like that. And this really, I don't want to, you know, belabor kind of how the different resource gathering mechanics work. Yeah, it's it's a supply chain game. It's a supply chain game, but and it's also a very simple one, really. There, you can have a you max out, I believe, at twenty huts. And, you know, so you can you can have uh, a maximum of about 80 of these workers to, to manage. And, you know, it gets disrupted a little bit by some of the events. But it's possible to have a completely balanced economy in this game. But it'll never get to be very efficient at generating any one resource. Yeah, you can kind of like you can kind of steer it in a direction at the sake of another resource say you have been your hunt like if you assign someone as a hunter they bring in two resources uh the game works on ticks which is every 10 ticks the resources come in and you see these ticks every time there's a timer it's just the way the little bar moves across and so every 10 ticks you get these resources and like a hunter or it's hunter right they do one meat and one fur every 10 ticks mm -hmm. but you, if once you unlock the tannery it's negative five fur becomes one leather. So you can balance it out really easily where you have five hunters and you have one tanner. And so you're bringing in as many leather as you, or fur as it needs to make one leather. But let's say you've been doing 10 uh, hunters at the beginning and no leather, no tanners. Later in the game, you could put like 10 people on tanners because you need 100 leather to build something. You can just churn out all that leather and put those guys back. And that, I don't know about you guys, but that's generally how I played was keep the resource guys on the core resources. And when I needed something specific, I would just put like 30 of my villagers on it and just churn it all out and then go back. Yeah. It's a very uh, effective little... Uh little numbers game and it grows with you. Yeah, and you spend a lot of time in it. And as you do that, you are seeing new elements to the story because as you're as you're doing that, you start to see these um, beggars that come or uh, wanderers that, you know, wander into your camp and things like that um, that may like ask to stay with you and, and beasts will come in and kill things. Um, you'll start to, you know, set up traps. And we should say that all of these events essentially happen in the form of a pop-up, pretty standard iOS pop-up that says, you know, such and such has occurred and you have an option. Like you can choose. Yeah. It looks like a pop-up from like Safari or something like mm -hmm. it's designed. I think it's designed almost to match the stuff we've seen from iOS to begin with. Yeah. Oh yeah. The gameplay is extremely simple. Now we haven't mentioned one thing about the look of this game that I absolutely loved. So we're talking about the incredibly sparse look of the game, the notification pop-ups that look like, you know, anything that might say, you know, click OK to print. Um, the um, basic style of like white text on a black background. 
as you light the fire, your the the fire that very first mechanic that we get has no gameplay effect. It's entirely just you wanting to keep the character of the builder warm. And what happens when the fire is burning is the screen goes from black with white text to white with black text. And sometimes you'll leave and come back and the fire will have died down and it'll have gone back to the black. And there's actually several levels of, of brightness. And uh, that completely basic, I feel like we talk about the game as atmospheric. It's the little things like that in addition to the really good descriptions. The second style of interrupter they have is if there's if the game is talking to you, if the builders has something to say, if there's one of those atmospheric messages, they overlay over your actions a little black box with white text. It just kind of fades up and fades down. A little message comes up, and it's it stalls you from taking your next action, and it's so lovely because it makes you read the text. And it's that's one of the big improvements, I think, over the browser game where they're separated. Um, is it makes you stop pressing the buttons for a second and see what the game wants you to see from that atmospheric point of view. Everything else comes up from the bottom of the screen, but the top of the screen is where you get those little, like, the, the little messages about the, you know, I need to keep her warm. Yes, you've got, like, a feed, and you've got your buttons. And these me- some of the messages kind of display in the feed, and some of them pop up to varying degrees, and it's it's very well thought out and designed in that way. I definitely yeah, agree. Yeah, and I also want to add, like, you know, you just said that when the fire goes out, nothing really happens. And I did learn that to be true. But how long did you guys go back making sure the fire didn't go out before you finally figured out that it really didn't have an effect on your game? I don't think I ever let it go out completely. I never let it go out completely. I never let it go out in my first playthrough. Because I think I only let it go out when I was out on a really long uh, part of the adventure roguelike part of it and I was out there for a very long time and I came back and it was all black and it said like the fire is out and my only thought was maybe that r- people don't collect resources at that time but I don't even know if that's the case but I was afraid to let the fire go out the whole time and constantly going back make sure that fire's roaring got to keep her warm who knows what'll happen well, they also tell you that's how they're saving the game so you start getting a sense of What happens if it goes out? Do I need to revert back to my last save? Like, yeah, but they don't ever. The nice thing about this game is, although I worried about the mechanics like that, the game was like, don't worry, we got you covered. The fire can go out. You're going to be fine. Yeah, it's a very forgiving game. So uh, we were talking a little bit about ways that the economy balances and, and like Nate, you were saying it's pretty it's pretty forgiving in the sense that you can pour your your work into any of the basic resources and be doing okay. Uh, But it is fun to kind of tune it. It reminded me very much of a game that I've wanted to talk about on this show, but it's in no way short. And that's Banished. Have any of you guys gotten a chance to play that? We have not. No, but a very good friend of mine who doesn't play a lot of games, but gets really, really into the games he does play, um, he actually has been talking to me about Banished for like a month straight, telling me I need to play this game, I need to play this game. So I'm pretty soon about to play this game. Oh, well, let me know what you think of it. As a Harvest Moon guy, you will love Banished. It's it's basically Sim City on the medieval town scale. And what's really interesting about that, you'd think it would strip away a lot of the complexity, but that's actually not true because it introduces... Um, moving your goods around as one of the primary limiters on you in that game. So it's a really, because, you know, transportation in this medieval village, you know, we don't have trucks and trains and a transit network. We've got, you know, guys with baskets. (laughs) So getting your goods, you know, from the field to the table is actually a a pretty big mechanic. Not to get too uh, off topic, but if you do like games where you're managing a little bit of an economy and you want to see a interesting different take on it that's not too expensive on steam definitely a good thing to pick up i've been meaning to check that out yeah i've always been a fan of resource management games for whatever reason actually i'm a big fan of rts games which always have a resource management 
aspect built into it. So that's kind of where my love of those comes from. So mechanic wise, we've got this cool resource management game that sort of emerges out of our cookie clicker of the um, of the keep the fire burning game. And initially, you might think that that's as far as things go. But not too long after you've started managing your little mini economy here, another option opens up. Um, you know, you're, you've initially had, uh, you know, keeping the fire burning in the, I don't know what it calls that area, the, the hut or the house or wherever you're keeping things warm. It's called a firelit room or to begin with, it's a dark room. Yes. And then the firelit room. Um, and then you move out into a modest village or as you upgrade it, perhaps even a, uh, a busy village or whatever it calls it. But finally you have the option of going out on the dusty path and the dusty path is the adventure gamey or more rpg-esque element of the game so suddenly your scale changes from this single room to this whole village all the way to i guess the entire world of the game uh, a, a map that that's drawn in a sort of an ascii art style where we can navigate around um exploring the area around the village that you're uh that you're inhabiting yeah this is the uh, the dusty path is almost the the outer layer of our puzzle box and it's the one that i found absolutely by far the most compelling part of the game absolutely i mean this is when the game took that next step for me when it became a game that i was like okay I love this game because I like we were saying at the beginning or I was just saying I can get into a resource management game. You give me some villagers, you give me some stuff to collect. I'm probably <laughs> going to play it for a little while. Like I'm just going to do that. And so when it started, I was like, yeah, OK, I got some villagers. I got some wood. I got some meat. Like, let's get this chain going. And then this happens and it's like, whoosh, this is a totally new game now. And I love roguelikes. And I know Reagan may disagree to some degree on some level that this isn't exactly a roguelike but it has those elements and it's just such a departure from what you're doing in that moment it's fantastic oh my gosh what was your impression when you first hit the dusty path laura i came to this game blind i mean i saw the first screen i threw nine and ten at it so when the dusty path opened well the first thing i did was i promptly you know tried to run around it was like oh wait a second things I can't just start exploring in a direction. This costs food. It costs water. And the, the very first thing I did was, okay, now I'm building for something. Yeah. I am going to build so I can explore. And it completely changed the game. I was more curious than I would have been had they had an image-based map. I didn't know what P, V, A, H, E, all the letters on the map, had no idea when any of them were. So it was even more tantalizing. Heck, I didn't know. I still don't know what half of them mean. I know what I know the core ones like I is iron mine and C is uh -huh. coal mine. Like I can get there on that. <laughs> yeah. I, I I figured about, but it's just it's so tantalizing to just, you know, walk on this very, you know, little path and you're counting squares. I don't think there's been any exploration game where I've been so obsessed with managing resources so I could get further. There are other games where you can run out of water or you run out of food, but this is the game where I was, you know, how much can I carry and get back in time and not die? It's the game became a little survivalist. And that's when really, you know, I started making the bad person decisions because <laughs> I really wanted to make sure I could get further and further exploring the game. And that's what made it so addictive. That survival yeah. element was was really the payoff of, in a lot of ways, the resource collection element, because it's incredibly expensive for you resource wise to move your little guy, even one box at the start, even one letter to the left, he's represented by a little at sign. And when you first start going anywhere, you probably aren't the first time you explore it, you're probably not prepared at all. I, I don't know about you guys. I died the very first time and probably the second and third time that I went out there uh, before I started getting a little bit more cautious about things. I yeah, I died uh, about four. I died as fast as it's possible for you to die 
the first time because I was like, wee, and just hit like up a lot and just died before I even looked at water or food or anything like that. I mean, I was dead. Whatever the bare minimum amount of steps it takes for you to die in the shortest amount of time, that's how fast I died the first <laughs> and time. And it's funny how much it capitalized that joy. You're like, you just go speeding off and then you're like, yeah, it turned that joy into something else. Like, fix this yeah and if you die the cool down to go out there again is much longer than the cool down to coming back successfully so there's there's also just a gameplay mechanic you in, you're incentivized because you know as you're exploring you're able to collect these resources through various means that your your village is is producing for you i've been talking about how it ties the gameplay to the storytelling and that was one of my favorite gameplay moments was that first time I tore out, I tore ass out of the village. I was just like, boom, I'm off like a, like a lantern or rocket. Uh, lanterns don't go anywhere. <laughs> I was off like a rocket and I shot off and I died immediately by being eaten by a lizard or something. And then you wake up back in the village again and you see a message that says, you know, I died out there. I'm sure of it. What happened? You know, she brought me back somehow. And in a lot of times, these basic kind of gameplay decisions are justified very well in the narrative. You know, he he comes back and it's it's the fact that, you know, she's um, she's got this locket and that locket becomes even more important to the story as you go along. You know, it's, she's, she's managed to bring you back from the dead. And um uh, you know, there's there's other things that I don't want to spoil because I know I don't want to spoil because they're related to the ending. But there are questions that if you start to pay attention to the game, I, that it's like these are things that are basic gameplay things, stuff that's basic to like the way the game works. And on my first playthrough, I wasn't questioning how they related really to the story, but it all works well together. And without spoiling anything, some of those things are, why does cloth show up in my traps all the time? That's one of my favorite questions. Or why are buildings built instantly when I press this button? Or why can I use two swords and a rifle at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Or how do your punches become so strong? Because your punches can become very, <laughs> very strong. strong. Yeah, so speaking of that, I mean, you do upgrade certain things like your, your punches. You get like Kung Fu Master skills uh, if you level up the punches. Uh, but that actually, again, that ties right back to the gameplay. Because if you're out there punching things a thousand times... Um, you know, you're you're probably doing something super wrong unless you're trying, you know, for for some kind of achievement. You're 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 doing something really wrong gameplay wise if you're just killing things by punching them over and over again. And so the game is going to really give you some perks that are going <laughs> to nudge you towards the com the kind of two to three hour completion window. So we've just reached the point in the game where we're starting to go out on the dusty path and we finally realize that there's a reason that we're collecting all these resources when we are managing our little villagers. And there's a moment in the game that's incredibly important when I think it just has given you enough reason to have that feeling of greed where you want more resources so you can go out on the <laughs> dusty path and suddenly... Give me all your leather. <laughs> Listen up, gaunt man. I'm taking yeah. all of your leather. There's nothing you can do about and it. And by the description, the leather may be your skin. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's very unclear. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> right at this moment, we have some text that appears that says, they are slaves. And suddenly every instance of the word villagers in the game changes to slaves. And you realize that now you're in charge of a slave camp rather than a simple village of, of... Yeah, that was my second favorite part of the game. That that little touch, that little thing that just changes the entire like mindset towards the whole your atmosphere. Villagers. Yeah, is, yeah oh, everything is word. different. I put the phone down on the table and looked at it and kind of was like, ooh, <laughs> was that... Should should I keep playing this game? Yeah, can I confess yeah. something? And then I picked it back up and was like, I guess I will. 
I, I'd like to confess that that's when I put the game down. I put it, and yeah. I didn't pick it back up on the phone. I picked it back up on the iPad. I was like, I wonder if I can play this game a little bit nicer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was something I had done. I mean, I had. I realized no, I, I couldn't have done anything differently. That's basically a part of uh, a part of the story, you know. You have to be. Yeah. If you're going to go out on this path, if you're going to explore the world and and defeat it, as is the clear goal of the game, you have to have slaves. You have to have these people churning out resources for you to burn on the dusty path. And I want to talk about the escalation of the dusty path, too, because so you have your home base, which is symbolized by A. If you're able to return back to A safely, all the resources you picked up while you're out there are put into your supply and but the further you get out from a and you can get pretty far each step costs one drink of water and you only have so much water it can be replenished by other locations but the further you get out the more human the uh the enemies become you start out with a lot of beasts and a lot of birds and things like that and like gaunt men which comes off as almost like a zombie type human but you start fighting soldiers with rifles and men working in mines and children and survivors and just people who are in your way now and it's all guys i i have to ask because i i've played the game a lot and i never encountered this section you're talking about with the children yeah i fought a lot of kids maybe you better describe it nate so every time you enter one of the towns, it seems to be, a, you know, this is a procedurally generated set of, of situations because if you go to one and you die, it's going to be in that location again. But what happens when you enter that 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 um, encounter might be a little bit different. But there'll be something like a youth is stood, is standing guarding a cachet or a youth is, it's, it's always described as a youth. And... They and you have to fight them. It's either fight them or die. You don't have a like once you're done, you can run away from future encounters. But when you're in a in a fight, you have to fight them. And it's just described as a youth. And when you kill them, you usually get one cloth. And a lot of times it'll be like you're fighting a survivor, a scavenger, a soldier, and just thrown in the middle, a youth guarding a box or a youth stands alone in the kitchen and then. You have to fight them just like you fought everyone else. Uh, The way the towns work is you keep having to decide if you want to continue the battle when you're in these towns. I'm kind of worried now because I'm, I can almost guarantee you that I didn't notice that I was killing children in this game. (laughs) (laughs) And I just steamrolled right over these poor children. That did happen to me too, though, is there are a lot of repeat encounters where the the flavor text of who you're about to fight is the same. And certainly as I got further into the game and I was just trying to get as far out and expand as much, these encounters, yeah, where you just get deeper and deeper and deeper. Sometimes I did just kind of breeze through the text and just hit fight, like fight, 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 and not read it as much. But yeah, you probably killed a lot of kids and you didn't even know it. And I don't know what's worse. Yeah, that's the funny thing is that you get more of those little details. You get more details the more, the the further in the game you progress. At the same time, that's also when you have been, you know, the grinding mechanic has taught you that you just want to keep fighting, get through, get the resources and go home. And that's when they start peppering it with a little extra details. Sometimes it's a child, sometimes it's a piece of a secret or a piece of a story and the game, if you decide to slow down again, the game will reward you. But it's, you know, you have to kind of balance it against that grinding mechanic or you just wanted to speed through. I don't know. This game, second time runs itself to speed runs. The first time, you know, spend the two hours. Yeah. I think I had, uh, I think I had a little too much momentum at that point because I had, I had played the first half of the game uh, and then bailed on it. So I would encourage anybody to, to play this through all the way the first time. Yeah. So now might be a good time for us to talk a little bit about the ending. And if you're still listening to this show and you haven't completed the game, go ahead and keep at it. Maybe, maybe pause us for a bit. You know, not going to take that long to complete the game. Uh, even if you're really taking your time, like I did maybe three 
hours or something like that. But let's talk about the ending of the game and uh, and the ending of the plot, the significance of some of the of the details that kind of might have flown under your radar as you were playing. You start to find the the edges of that dusty path, both literally finding the edges of the map and you know the outside limits of what you can do in the gameplay. And as you're doing that, and you're fully exploring the character of of the builder who's starting to uh, really mom you out about killing all these children, <laughs> and uh, you're you know exploring the world and you're starting to find clues uh, as to what's going on in the world. There are soldiers and there are snipers that are trying to kill you. Um, there's what else do we find? We start to find alien crash sites yeah boreholes well, the, yeah the alien alloy in the crash site was what really triggered to me like okay there's an even bigger picture now right you know you've got soldiers and you've got uh all that you've got snipers who shoot like they hit like a truck so if you run into one of those good luck you're pretty much dead katanas so i'm guessing this must be yeah <laughs> Japan. yeah the grizzled veterans of the military carry katanas which is always funny um but once you start finding alien alloy, it's like, okay, now where is this going? Yeah. And part of me was expecting it to take one more step into another, into a third intergame where now I'm exploring. And in a sense, it kind of does. It kind of but, does. Yeah. It does. It does. It has a it has a major gameplay switch again, but it's brief. I was like, part of me expected it to be a whole new, like, third layer of entire new game. But it does have a huge switch. In the director's commentary that follows the game, uh, he talks about having planned a sort of an intergalactic or at least intercontinental battle element where you'd take your villagers out as a uh, as a you know fighting force and uh, fight against other nations or other planets. And that, it didn't end up making it into the final version of the game, but you kind of get that sense that that this was a game that's a fractal where every new layer is a new uh, a new experience. I would totally play that game. Yeah, if Spore couldn't pull it off, then this game can't pull that off. True. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about Spore. Not now. Not, <laughs> not to me. But uh, but I think it is it is nice to say that that even the Dusty Path, which is so much larger than any other part of the game, it's not the last new gameplay that they introduce. Uh, but what they do introduce is your character is collect now finds a crashed. Wanderer spaceship. And at this point, you might pick up on the fact that the word wanderer is the race of aliens that are on this planet. Did anybody here pick up on that or did you did not? not pick up on that? Nope. It, it took me a while. I picked up on it as soon as I was listening to the developer commentary. <laughs> exactly. Exactly for me as well. Oh, wow. I just picked this up, guys. As soon as you told me, I picked up that it was aliens. Wow. I was complaining about how often I was getting shot by snipers. And someone was like, are you doing anything that would piss off a sniper? And I was like, maybe it's just who I am. I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> maybe. And I, I was like, maybe there's something like noticeable about my character so i try to try of course there's no physical description of yourself mm -hmm. it only ever refers to you as the wanderer as the wanderer i didn't i picked up that i was other i picked up not human i didn't pick up the wanderer was the race i thought it was like Man. that i was a wanderer kind of like the doctor sure you know. yeah and if you pay very close attention you can notice that there are some times where it refers to other beings in the game world as wanderers almost anyone that's ever friendly to you in the villagers, uh, the wanderers that come to stay with you in the town, uh, you know, all of them are described as uh, wanderers. And it's done very subtly. And it's a lowercase w wanderer, but everything is lowercase in this yeah, game. Yeah, you guys are blowing my mind on this. I had no idea. <laughs> Did you listen to the director's commentary? I listened to about half of it, but as I was saying at the beginning of this podcast, most of the time I played this game was while I was doing the rest of like my life. So I didn't have a lot of time to just sit and listen to it. Um, that question of why are these snipers shooting at me? Never crossed my mind. I figured it was because I was raining hell upon anything and everything that was within reachable distance. Of my <laughs> well, the towns are terrified of you. And that's one of the things about, you know, you mentioned not reading about the youth, like the people in the town are behaving as if 
you have all of the armor in the world and are just coming and killing them all, which you are. But even when you're not a good player yet, they're terrified of you. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if that was just because I had a whole encampment of slaves on the other side of the <laughs> map. But it, it started making me think a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. You guys just made me have like an even deeper appreciation of this game. I did not put any of that together, nor did I obviously do my lore research for this game before we recorded. Well, so. I'm glad you get to experience <laughs> the game anew right now. Yeah, I love that the, uh, the developer commentary kind of went into some of that and kind of opened my eyes to some of it. One thing that that if you pay close attention, you know, it will say, you know, you're, you're fighting with a wanderer or you're encountering a wanderer. And there are some places where it describes these people that it describes as wanderers as having four arms. Yes. And I thought, that's odd. He has four arms. What's that about? And then I was like, well, I'll go on playing my game. That doesn't matter. And um, <laughs> that's the I mean, that that's that's why I say it ties. It all ties into the gameplay. Your character can like basically uh, whatever, whatever the number of, of <laughs> weapons in your inventory is you can use all of them at once which is wonderful oh my god that mm -hmm. all makes so much sense yeah that thank was, you i'm yeah i'm glad i'm a part of this <laughs> chinese box my friend yeah so and that's a that's a really amazing thing about it that made me want to play the game a second time i loved that they included it included the developer's commentary at the end to kind of explain some of the things that you might have missed. And I love that it immediately gives you an option to start the game over. And in fact, um, gives you another challenge, a challenge to play the game differently, which yep. we'll talk about in a second, but we should probably talk about the ending. I was going to say, we haven't even talked about, the yeah, ending. exactly. I, I'm excited to talk about the other run, but like, so how does it end guys? This game kind of like a, like a Chinese, uh, box style narrative uh i don't i'm not familiar with these chinese boxes that you chinese, keep referring yeah. to <laughs> the interlocking so, okay so a chinese a chinese box narrative is an is a story with a frame within it where the drama is told in the form of a narrative inside of a narrative inside of a narrative like frankenstein was like that i think that's russian dolls yes it's also sometimes called a russian doll matryoshka doll, yeah. matryoshka, uh, doll yeah. style narrative i guess you could call it um, but I've always, I've heard that the term Chinese box. These are all really racist. Uh, can't we just say it's layered? How is it racist? <laughs> There's nothing racist. Like that is a style of doll. That's, and it's also it's a, a very common term. <laughs> and it, it has a Wikipedia page. I looked it up. Okay. Okay. It seems, it just seems rather, it just seems rather racially specific. <laughs> okay. Well you can go and edit the Wikipedia page and see if you get it, get reverted back. All right. Fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Nate, how does this game end? So, how does this game end, Nate? And please try to not to drop any f bombs or uh, racial slurs. So, Nate, how does this game end? You guys will probably do a better job, obviously, explaining kind of the the story of what's happening at this moment. But basically, throughout your wanderings, you've been collecting this alien alloy, which is found in crash sites. But you will also, at some point, find a ship. If you're able to make it back to that ship. To make it to the ship and make it back home safely because the ship is usually pretty far out into the into the dusty path. You then have the option to use your the alien alloy that you have found to upgrade either the thrusters or the hull HP of this ship, which, you know, at least to me, I was like, I have no idea what either of these mean, but Health points are usually something that I want as many of them as possible. So I put them. a lot of them into health and a few of them into thrust. And you can hit liftoff. And once you hit liftoff, you hit this whole other gameplay style. Suddenly, the game which has had zero actual action in it. I mean, this is a game that's text-based and it's a, it's a storytelling experience and it's about making choices. The combat. The combat. The combat has a pace to it, but it's not action. I find it interesting that the game moves from a game which requires almost none of your attention to a completely different genre that requires your absolute attention. So it's not like Galaga is not the right word, but you're, you're controlling a spaceship at the bottom of the screen while and it's just a circle or no, it's a pound sign, right? Yeah. And there's circles coming out at you. They start out with just a few of them and it gets more and more circles coming down at you. And based on how much thrust, how much alien alloy you, alien alloy you put into your thrusters, you can move left and right faster. And based on how much you put into your hit points, 
that's how many times you can get hit by these circles. And it gets more and more and more of these little circles coming at you. And if you're able to survive through a, whatever it is, asteroids or the atmosphere or whatever it is that's hitting you, that's how you beat the game. That's when the game ends is you get through this wave of of zeros or circles. So we should mention that this happens because uh, not too long before this event in the game, the builder who is your, uh, you know, your only real companion in the game. Moral compass. <laughs> and she's sort of the moral compass of the game, yeah. Um, she, horrified at your actions, horrified at your, you know, taking slaves and killing people and et cetera, et cetera, she disappears. And suddenly you're no longer able to build anything in the game. And you're taking off in this alien spaceship, presumably to find her. Now, whether you're trying to find her for revenge or whether you're trying to find her for atonement or what, it's never really clear. There's still some really sort of evocative um, ambiguity to the story here. But as you're taking off and you're trying to dodge these asteroids, you're seeing some text about the the main character's regret and his goal to you know to find the woman that left yeah and you're trying to read it while you're also trying to dodge all these circles so yeah i will say that i was only i was it, it flashes up which is it flashes right in the right spot right in the middle of the screen so you kind of read it but you're also kind of in this like reagan was saying like kind of panicky like whoa, this is not what I've been doing for the last two and a half hours. And I don't know about you guys, but I crashed my spaceship the first time. I did it twice. Several times. Yeah. Because I was always more excited about reading the text. And um, we mentioned this earlier, but the locket does come back into play. That same locket, um, when the builder leaves, she leaves behind the locket. And yes, you've had at the uh, for the earlier game, you've had a compass that points you to the next important place on the map. And, and now... You have the locket that points you, that kind of gives you a getting warmer when you approach the alloy. Which I actually, again, my like, wee adventure, like, it took me forever to even acknowledge what the compass and what the lockets and everything were pointing to. So I was always just like, I haven't been this direction yet. And I would go that direction until I died. And then I haven't been this direction and just kind of slowly put together my, my arsenal. Yeah, but it's, I really enjoyed that the locket was, you know, the temperature, it was, it was getting warmer towards the alien alloy, which, you know, you think of, you know, locket usually heart-shaped, it's warmth, the builder and the fire, all of these, you know, you've been in a cold, lonely, dark, greedy world for a while. You know, I, I wouldn't say the game ends on hope. But at least there's a potential for some way you can atone, as you said, you can get better. Um, but I thought the most emotive part about it was that locket getting warmer was the thoughts of the builder as you were leaving. It's like, I'm a terrible person, but I have the chance to be decent elsewhere. This place is just messed up. Yeah. She, you know, I hadn't thought about the kind of themes of warmth in there, and it really does leave it ambiguous as to whether you are trying to find this woman to redeem yourself or, or if you're pursuing her, uh, you know, was she just another one of the slaves and does he find her? That's a question that's left entirely unanswered. Uh, but if you have a lot more questions at the end of this game, you do have one recourse and that is that you can play another game called the ensign, which is the prequel to this game. And uh, I should say the the main game is a collaboration between the creator of the original web game and the iPhone version. The Ensign, the prequel, was made exclusively by the guy who created the iPhone version. And, and the way he described it, uh, I, I downloaded it uh, because he talked about it in the developer's commentary. He didn't want to touch your, um, your interpretation of the ending, so he made it a prequel. Um, but what it does is it expands on the, uh, the dusty path mechanic, that's really all there is to it. Uh, it doesn't have any other resource management in the same way that the main game does. It gets you right onto the dusty path. And it also amps up the difficulty of the dusty path in a lot of ways. And while it's doing that, it fills in and colors a lot of the background to the story of, 
uh, this game. And I won't spoil any of that for you guys because it's really satisfying, but I, I will say that just like a lot of gameplay elements that I hadn't questioned were questioned in the story as we went through, through the first game, even more of them were questioned in, uh, in the Ensign. And uh, so you might have encountered a, a frog in a swamp in the first game that seemed a little bit out of place, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, that's tied back in. Uh, the fact that it's never day, if it's always dark unless you have a burning fire. That's one thing I never questioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, if you, if you want to continue down the path that this game plays, where it kind of bends your expectations of gameplay, do it. Yeah. I like, as you were talking about it, I went online and, or I just went through the app store and bought it. Yeah. It introduces a lot of really interesting mechanics too. Like I mentioned, you're out on the dusty path. Uh, items have durability uh, Mm. that goes down over time. So because you only have your own personal inventory to manage uh, and you have a, you have a place where you can kind of deposit items, but there's, a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, and this is another game that's only 99 cents. So uh, if you enjoy this game, there's more to play. Yeah, I just bought it. Let's, though, talk briefly about the other way to play A Dark Room, which comes about upon completion of the assumed way that everyone will beat The Dark Room, which is using vid- villagers, building huts, slaves, and maximizing your production. Yeah, using <laughs> slaves. Once you've beat it... Labor, my slaves. Once you've beat it, once you've completed, you've made it in your rocket ship through the asteroids, uh, you get a little bit more text, and then it just hits a white screen with your the time it took you to complete it, your best time it took you to complete it, and then it says, uh, and I'm, I don't know the exact words, but it's basically, try it again without building any huts. And it is an entirely different game when you do it that way. Almost an absurd requirement because huts are the very first thing that you can build and they are the thing that allows you to start having villagers uh, collect resources for you. And the idea that built, that playing the game without huts, that's almost almost crazy because it means that you'd be having to collect all of the resources yourself. Yeah, when I finished this game, I think I even text to you guys, I was like, okay, I finished it. That was fantastic i don't think i'm gonna do the no hut run i'll look it up online and see what it's like and then about an hour later i was like man i want to keep playing a dark room i'm gonna do a no hut run and and i went for it and i know laura and shane you both have have completed it as well i have completed a no hut i have not so i want you to tell me a little bit about it now because i have not had a chance to experience that yet it, it it does change the story entirely, which the two of you have picked up better than I have, like what's going on. But gameplay wise, th- there is the merchant, which is you usually can trade an exorbitantly um, high amount of resources for one of another resource so that you have that option. But for the most part, you are collecting everything you need via the dusty path. I wonder if it tells you in a, any kind of description if the the merchant is a wanderer or not. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder. That's a good point. That's the the wanderer or the merchant arrives. It's like the fourth thing you can build is a trade post. Yeah. And once you've built that and it's like it's really high. I mean, you know, this is an extreme example, but like the alien alloy is a thousand fur, like 500 iron and it's it's a lot. Um, so while that's a resource there, you, you can't rely on the merchant. You, ha- you pretty much spend your entire time in the dusty path. You get the compass really early and you're yeah. just grinding out resources. Once you have, in fact, once you, if you're trying for the no hut run, once you get, uh, out onto the dusty path, uh, still having not built any huts, the, the, the plot really does start to change. And the builder uh, seems almost like a different character. I have, I have one c- critique of the game in the no hut run, narratively. Mm-hmm. And that is that uh, the builder was kind of long suffering in the main game. She, uh, you know, she's like, oh, I'll, fine, I'll, I'll build you this, I'll build you that. Please don't go out and kill people today. Oh, you did? Oh, it's okay. I'll keep building things for you. Uh, 
you know, right up until you have her build an armory and it says, I'll force her. And you do. And she's like, poof, I'm out. In the no hut run, she gets angry at you right away uh, because of your ability to make bone spears. Huh. And it's like, I was, you were making me like mega swords for a long time in the alternate path on this game. So narratively, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I never bothered to make a bone spear because my punches were so good. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the most fun things. I actually, I actually played it uh, that way a lot too on my on my no hut run. Was going for no. Uh... Oh well, I almost never used any weapons. I was doing. I know I was kind of like joking about it at the beginning, but I punched my way the entire way through. Near the <laughs> end, your punches do twenty seven damage. A rifle shot does five, and grenades <laughs> do 15. Punch that sniper out. I did. I punched a ton of snipers. It took me a while. It took me so long to build the stuff that allows you to carry more that my precious, precious space could not be used. Like a rifle weighs 50. Um, a steel sword weighs 50. And my punch <laughs> did 27. Was Free. Yeah, my punch was free. It just my arms, you know, and so I, <laughs> all I, four I, of them. I did the same thing on my no hut run. I was punching things because I needed the space in my bag for resources because I was, I was sure as hell not gonna be making leather or cloth or, you know, mm -mm. getting. I didn't have anyone mining for me. I had to carry all that stuff back on my back. Yeah, so. I had a rifle twice. And I died both times with the rifle. I had some grenades a couple times, but for the most part, I was just spamming. I was hitting punch as soon as I could punch, and I was hitting food, which gave you 10 hit points back. So I'd go out with like 45 food, which would be depleted by the time I'd reach my destination because I was going pretty far out, and just my fists. And I managed to beat the entire game with just... My forearms, apparently, I didn't know that when I was playing it, and my bag full of meat. <laughs> well, it makes sense if you're doing 27 damage with your punch. Well, yeah, now I'm imagining like a like a Goro. What's that? What's that Pokemon with forearms? Reagan, it was Machamp. Machamp, yeah. You went to Pokemon. I went to Mortal Kombat. Goro had forearms too, and he would pick people up and punch them with his other two arms. So, <laughs> so, so now that I know that I have four arms, that's what I want to imagine I was doing to the snipers. Makes perfect sense now. I, will, I, can, will I blow your mind if I tell you that you can complete a no hut run faster than a hut run? How? You go, you go hard for the iron mine, and then you go hard for the cart, and then you go hard for the end of the game. Yeah, that's pretty much what I did too. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. What was your time on your no hut run? Mine was 240 minutes. Um, and which was about an hour longer than my hut run. And I only think it was longer because I did, I had not realized yet that the locket pointed towards the alien alloy. And I was just exploring and punching my way through the world. Yeah. My no hut run was about two and a half hours, which means it was only about a half hour longer than my normal run. And I wasted a lot of time gathering leather on that run. So I'm pretty sure I could beat it faster than that. I, I was out there like basically killing nothing but gaunt men for like an entire breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the fact that you can measure the your gameplay by the foods that you were eating while you were playing this game. I mean, That's I amazing. ate, let's see, I know I, I ate two pizzas at different sittings while playing this game. <laughs> I had a cheeseburger the other day while playing this game. I ate tons uh, of cured meat. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me, so I, I haven't gotten a chance to play the, the No Hut run, and I may not for a little while. Can you give me a little bit of spoilers about what's truly different about the ending of the No Hut run? Okay, so the, the, the final end of the story in the No Hut run, um, the builder is with you right up to the end, and she is very excited when you find the spaceship because she wants to get off the planet with you. She's not as mad at you as she was, uh, I guess. She doesn't disappear. So um, when you get in the ship and you are headed off the planet, um, you get pretty much into a situation where I found it impossible to actually really dodge the 
asteroids. They seem like they came a whole lot harder. I'm not sure that it's impossible to dodge all the asteroids on the no hut run, but I don't think it is. I was never good at dodging asteroids in the first place. And there's a whole lot more of them. It's basically a wall of them. But eventually she uses her locket to push them out of the way. And you see them kind of part like in front of you. And so yeah. she uses her power to save you, but she dies. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. But she is much less disappointed in you. Mm -hmm. And that's important. <laughs> so depending on your interpretation of the main game, it's either a better or a worse ending. I'm not sure. Sigh. That was a really good that was a really good moment of silence, you guys. <laughs> like right after we all thought about it for a second. I don't know. But we definitely have to play the ensign. Yeah. So we've already talked about where you can reach this game. This game is available on the web for totally zero dollars, and this game is available on iOS for ninety nine cents, which is a crazy deal for a game that took this developer uh, five months just to implement on iOS and implement all the cool improvements that they made, and and that's not even counting however long the original developer took to put this game together for the web. Um, and it's just a truly innovative and really surprising, cool experience. Um, anybody have any closing thoughts about about the game? I can't think of any other game that has provided an experience like this game. And I've only been able to say that with it. I've enjoyed every game we've played on this podcast, but it's we've been able to create the the game stew where it's like it's one part this game and it's one part this game and it makes its own game but there are very few games there well there's no other game that i can think of that provided an experience like this and i think that in itself is something to be said for let alone the fact that it was a ton of fun it was interesting um it was sad it was like you got to feel tough sometimes because you're punching stuff it was <laughs> it was great it had no choice and lots of choice. It was ruthlessly simple. I mean, this, this is a game that you could have played on a Commodore 64, but uh, that also was incredibly complex in its layers of gameplay and its story. And everything about this game screamed love. The, developer put an the developers put an enormous amount of care and love into this game, and it really shows through. It blew my mind that the two developers have ne had never met in real life while this whole project was put together. I made it that far into the commentary. I wasn't sure whether or not to recommend this to people because it feels like when you play it, you have such an individual reaction. And I knew I thought the game was super high quality, but I feel like there is a little bit of barrier at the beginning. If you don't, if you hit the light of room and you're not immediately taken in by the first five minutes of gameplay if you think it's dumb and just grindy and hitting buttons. It, I feel like people might not be willing to go with the game. So I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it as much as I did because it feels like a bit of a risk sometimes for people who are more impatient or people who aren't expecting an experience. I teed it up to you guys as, you know, this is going to be an experience. I don't think everyone gets that when they download this game. And so I'm glad more people are going to play it because it, it does feel a little bit risky at times. If you just sent the browser link to someone and was like, try this game out, I don't know how far they'd get. And it's so it's such a shame because the game gets better the longer you play it and more meaningful. Yes. That's something the developers actually talk about in the commentary and something that they really tried to kind of struggle against. They wanted to give you that sparse minimal, no context, little interaction experience right up front. But they also don't want you to turn away from the game before you before it starts to open up. And um, I'm really glad that I did put some time. I, I know that you recommended this game to me and I just happened to I downloaded it on my iPhone and it had been there for days for like weeks, really, I think. And um, one day it was just I had some time on my hands and I opened it up. And the first thing I did when I opened it up was look at the game and think, wow, what a ripoff. People paid money for this. It's just got one button. What a dumb looking game. Who would play this? But I, I knew you were a smart person. So I, <laughs> I persisted for a few extra minutes and suddenly it just started drawing me in. And that's, 
that's something that's absolutely amazing about this game. And I hope people don't get turned away from it in the first five minutes or even 10 or 15 minutes, because it's a game that really builds on that initial simple, basic, minimal experience into something that just blows minds and kicks ass. With four fists. Yeah, I, I do wonder if if the people who can't get into it in the first three, four or five minutes are people who wouldn't get into it at all. You know, like if you're willing to commit to that beginning, then you're probably willing to commit to the end. And if you're not, then it might just not be the game. I will say my wife is not a gamer at all, really. You know, there are certain games she really loves, uh, but she's pretty selective. And I, I got her set up with this game and she beat it uh, in about three hours. And it's, it's, it's a game that just so carefully guides you in from any kind of gameplay experience that you might already enjoy, you know, like I think anyone can pick up this game and try it. So I think it's a solid recommendation for anybody. We're sitting here saying like, well, you know, if you can get through the first five minutes of this game, that's like saying, oh, well, if you can get through the first 10 pages of Lord of the Rings, it's just, it's just really excellent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I to your point, I I was hooked. I was interested immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, I I personally did not feel any lag in my appreciation for the game. Like it started, and I was like, "Well, this is something I've never done before." Particularly because, unlike you guys, interactive fiction is not something that I've been a part of, and we didn't really at any point during this podcast even really talk about interactive fiction but it has that element we that should be a whole other episode of the short game and we've been wanting to do that for a long time well let me give my final thoughts on on the game and that is that i think this game was uh i knew it would be a perfect game for our show when i realized that uh it had roguelike elements in a game that you could complete in two hours (laughs) true and uh You know, there's just so many things that made this game perfect for the short game. The combination of the narrative with the gameplay, the simplicity of everything, the wonderful storytelling. Um, But I got to say, the part that really got me addicted is that dusty trail. And I am I am now on my uh, uh, like a true roguelike. The ensign does make you start completely over when you die. And I I am on, I don't know how many times I have replayed it. I've beaten it a couple of times now, but gosh, what a great game. Um, The the gameplay on every level of this game is just perfect. And a, it feels like a flower that unfolds in front of you on your iPhone. (laughs) That was beautiful. (laughs) Some purple prose right there. All right. Well, I think we got to close it at that because uh, none of us are going to outdo your your purple flower, yeah. Shane. It's like a million suns exploding before your eyes and thousands of children being slain. Anybody have any last things to add before I do the outro? It's like a tiny piece of chocolate that you just eat and then a new bigger piece of chocolate appears right in front of you. <laughs> and when you tap on it, it t- becomes your slave. <laughs> it's a small child riding a wild beast, being punched by a four-armed Indeed. man. And a it's single fantastic. piece of cloth wafting in the breeze after you defeat him. Yes. <laughs> it's so beautiful. All right. A single tear is rolling right. down my cheek. So hopefully you guys have uh, already had a chance to complete and finish this game and uh, play the Ensign, and uh, and I'll be keeping an eye on these developers, hoping that they put out something equally innovative and interesting uh, in soon. So uh, where can everybody find everybody on the internet? Laura, where can people find you if they want to keep up with your doings? I'm on Twitter at Laura J. Nash, and the web series that I'm writing for is going to have its first episode launching in December. It's getting edited right now. I think December's the launch date. Woo, Space Happens. Space Happens. That's a good good name. We think so. That's why we chose it. Awesome. (laughs) Nate, where can people find you? Uh, You can find me on Twitter at NateSTL. And check out my band's new record at at BearHive. Right. Yes. Um, I'm I'm sorry, Nate. I I, I realized that um, I forgot to drop some of your music into the last episode because I said I was going to, and then I didn't. 
I know. I'm a loser. It's all right. The whole reason he comes on this show is to promote his band, right? Yep. That's what Reagan does is he slings strings along our celebrity guests. <laughs> While you steep inside your river dry. Making strides, don't mind when you're terrified. Matter over mind. Matter over mind. And Shane, where can people find you? I am at 8 bit Shane, and uh, I can be found there most days. And uh, of course, uh, I'm your host, Reagan. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. I spell it funny. It's R A Y G A N K. And you can follow our show on Twitter. We are at underscore short game. Um, and of course, you can find all the show notes and any extra stuff at www.theshortgame.net. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this week, and hopefully, we'll catch you next week for another cool episode of The Short Game. Bye.